Okay, uh, thanks for the organizers and thanks uh, everyone for staying. Um, I'm just gonna jump right into it because uh, there's not a lot of time and uh, we've already heard a lot of introductions. So, um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, using the EFT of large scale structure to hopefully tell us something about the EFT of dark energy. Um, okay, so the goals and why we're trying to do this program, uh, first of all is that we want to get some kind of cosmological information, like either about primordial non-Gaussianities, uh, which would be an early universe thing, or late universe stuff like dark, dark energy, massive neutrinos, something about the universe. We want to extract from um, the uh, statistics of clustering uh, on large scale, so from large scale structure. So uh, in the case of FNL, uh, there's already very tight constraints from Planck. So in order to use large scale structure, the uh, predictions have to be very good, like less than a percent uh, to, 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 to beat the Planck constraints. Luckily for, uh, for dark energy, at, at late time, there are much less constraints. And so uh, we have the opportunity now to, to place uh, uh, very tight constraints on, on dark energy parameters. Um, OK. And as you know, if you go to smaller scales, there's more modes that you can measure, um, which are better statistics. It means you can put uh, more constraints. There's just more information on small scales. So the idea is that we want to understand all of the observables in large scale structure to as high accuracy as we can on the small scales that we can. Um, and this includes uh, the dynamics of dark matter clustering, which would be the various the power spectrum, the bispectrum, et cetera. We need to understand the effect of baryons on large scales, bias, uh, retro space distortions, basically everything you need to connect, uh, to connect the, the galaxy catalog to uh, some observable or some prediction from a theory that you have. So that's what we want to do. So, uh, in or so there's a program called the EFT of large scale structure, which is aiming at doing this, just doing very accurate comp computations in perturbation theory. So as a quick review, uh, the variables that we consider are the overdensity of matter, um, delta m, and uh, the divergence of the velocity. So we have the continuity equation for, um, for these two variables. There's an Euler equation for the velocity and uh, Poisson equation uh, telling us yeah, how the potential is sourced. The thing about the EFT of, of large scale structure is that on the right hand side, there's this thing called the effective stress tensor, which uh, basically um, is a way of summarizing the way that short scale modes on scales much uh, smaller than what we observe, how the interaction of those modes with long scale modes uh, affect the Euler equation. And so um, this you can get by smoothing over fields or thinking in a bunch of different ways. But the bottom line is that this is some, uh, this is some thing that we have to expand. In so this S stands for short. The short scale comes from short scale modes. But we expand it in terms of the long wavelength fields, uh, the potential, the velocity, with derivatives, um, all in a way that's uh, consistent with um, the symmetries of GR. Um, so uh, the point here is that the the spatial dependence or the k dependence is fixed by these uh, various terms that we can write, but sitting in front are some unknown time dependent functions that um, can't be predicted from within the EFT. Okay, so um, another, so for at one loop, what does this look like? Uh, the power spectrum, there's a linear piece which you can get from CAM or something for, for dark matter. There's one loop piece. Uh, P22 and P13, they're called, and there's a counterterm piece uh, from the EFT. So the the standard uh, one loop pieces, they're loop integrals. They're this just comes from the perturbation theory. You have to do some uh, loop integral, and um, yeah, that's what the correction is. Uh, there's some cutoff, and in fact, the, the counterterm is present. Um, will cancel dependence on the cutoff. Pretty standard story, but these are the ingredients. We have linear, uh, we have the linear power spectrum, some convolution integrals to find 
the uh, one loop correction, and then some counter term contribution with a fixed dependence on k, k squared times p11, and some unknown coefficient uh, cs squared, which we'll call the speed of sound or the coupling constant or et cetera. Okay. So the kind of where we are now in the EFT of large scale structure is the following. So um, first of all, so this is comparison of the theory with, uh, with n-body simulation. The, this gray region here are the error bars for the n-body simulation. So you can see that, I mean, th this was a very big simulation, like big multi-dark sky, so, uh, something like that. Um, and so these error bars are, are, are really tiny. So this is a precision comparison of the theory with, with, uh, with the nonlinear data. So, uh, so the various things we have here, the brown is, is the linear theory, fails here at 0.03 or something. Uh, the red is the two loop SPT, which is basically a two loop calculation without counter terms. Uh, the green is the one loop uh, EFT, which is what I just showed previously. So that involves fixing the value of this one CS squared. And this blue is um, the two loop EFT, but with just the same CS squared. So just, uh, just one free parameter. Now, the important thing I want to highlight is this kind of shaded blue region around here, which is the, uh, the theoretical error, the estimated theoretical error in the calculation, which comes from estimating the size of the three loop term in the, in the calculation. And this is important because it means that we kind of have, have an idea of where our calculation is going to break down. So, so we know that when uh, the error bars of the calculation are crossing out of the error bars of the simulation, that's when we start losing uh, control of, of the calculation. So um, yeah, with, with two loops, if you have two extra counter terms, uh, the fit goes out much longer. But uh, anyway, that, that's, that's, uh, that's the status. So there's been a lot of stuff uh, going on here. Um, I won't review everything, but uh, and this is even just the recent stuff, just with EFT. So there's a lot more. A lot of people have done stuff in this room. Uh, there's a lot of things to do. But the program is long. There's a lot of things to, to understand. Computing, power spectrum, and bias spectrum to high precision, understanding this in redshift space and with bias. Um, there was a bunch of stuff about resummation that we heard about just to get these calculations under control. So it's, uh, and then you want to make everything fast so that you can actually use it to compare to data. And all this is, is, is going on. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to EFT of dark energy. So, I don't know, any questions? <laughs> it was fast. Okay, so now the idea is to use this framework to tell us something about um, the EFT of, of, of dark energy. So we've seen something like this before. Uh, this is the action that tells us about this extra de degree of freedom, the Stuckelberg field. Um, and since we're interested in computing uh, nonlinear corrections to the power spectrum, we need the higher order version of, of what we've seen a lot. Um, that involves, well, you have to actually go up to quartic order in the action, which we did, but I just didn't write it. Um, yeah, so you write out all the, all the, all the terms that break the time diffs um, and see what you get. This particular form is related to the Hordensky form. Um, that's why you have these sort of blocks of different operators. Uh, but anyway, so now our goal is to see how these M's basically would, would affect uh, dark matter clustering. Uh, this is in unitary gauge, so so that's why you have operators which break the time diff. So then I was Stuckelberg in this the field. So there, yeah, there's a pi field hidden in the metric here. Oh, usually Stuckelberg field is something unobservable, right? But if you think that this dark energy, dark energy has real scale de scale and degree of freedom, which actually yeah, because the time. I guess there's a gold stone. It's the time diffeomorphisms are broken, so it's broken by any dynamic of distance which you have, which you which you also in time. Yes. Time will break time diffeomorphism, right? 
Yes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, there's an extra degree of freedom in the metric here, and we're looking for the effects of that. So, um, so we need we want to convert this into the dark matter uh, clustering equations. So, okay, what do we have? The top line is um, is just the normal continuity equation. So this is for delta of of matter, delta matter, and this is the standard mixing from lambda CDM. The second line is the is the uh, is the Euler equation. Uh, we have a one-loop counterterm uh, present here as well, and actually all the effects of this field when we take the quasi-static limits such, such that uh, the 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 dark energy is is just a kind of constraint field. Uh, all of the new information is is in this is in phi, which I'll show in a second. But yeah, these are the standard dark dark matter coupling vertices. And um, the new vertices, which again just come from this phi here, look something like this. Now, OK, these are just new couplings of the deltas. So it's just uh, mode coupling. Here's a quadratic coupling of the deltas, cubic and cubic. Um, there's a particular k dependence of these, of these kernels. These are just analogous to the alphas. Um, but we just find them by solving perturbatively from the dark energy action. So they enter here, gamma 2, gamma 3. And uh, these mu coefficients here are time dependent and are related to the, the m's in the previous uh, action or the alphas or however you're parameterizing the, the dark energy action. So, but at the level of dark matter clustering, um, these mu's are, are the effects that we can, uh, are, are the things that can change the uh, dark matter clustering. And so seeing some signature that's related to one of these vertices would be, uh, would be a measurement or constraint on, on these mu, which then is a constraint on the dark energy parameters. Okay, so, yep, I just said that. And yeah, just a, a comment. So yeah, the, the, these mu's change the nonlinear scale by something that's you could if it's just a small change, it's it scales uh, just with something that depends on the um, the scale uh, of the linear power spectrum n. But uh, okay, it's it's not a, Matt was talking about that a little earlier. But okay, so what do we have now? Um, we we now we want to solve this thing for the one loop power spectrum. Uh, one important thing is that. Uh, we have to use exact time dependence because there's no uh, EDS approximation that we can use. So, uh, okay, we just have to have Green's functions. It's kind of boring, but you do it. And the counter term has the same functional form as before. There's no new kind of UV dependence from these vertices. Uh, so it just has exactly the same form as before. Although the actual numerical value of the CS could be different because the small scale physics could be different. Okay, so we have the same kind of expansion again. P11 now it should be the linear power spectrum coming from something like EFT cam or high class or something that includes the, the linear um, effects of dark, of, of, of dark energy. And then we compute the loop corrections, P22 and P13. Um, now because uh, we have these Green's functions, there's no simple time dependence. That's why we have to integrate over momentum and time. These integrals over time are for the Green's functions. Again, it's kind of boring. The, the takeaway is that these terms always break up into um, factors of a time-dependent function times a momentum-dependent function. So we can actually do this calculation reasonably well because you can integrate the time separate from the momentum. Um, yeah, so that's in the case that you don't have a, a scale-dependent growth factor you can do this. Um, otherwise, it would be much harder. The counter term is the same. OK, so, so that's basically the bottom line for, for, uh, for this calculation. And so we wanted to test with something, um, with some simulations that Hans gave us. Um, so uh, basically, at this point, we can kind of we could plug in any um, 
any values of these mu's that come from a specific theory uh, of dark energy, or we could just constrain the mu's by themselves. But uh, for example, we tested our, our calculation with uh, an NDGP simulation. Um, so NDGP is characterized by this omega parameter and has this special beta um, thing in it that makes it uh, changes the Newton constant or however you want to think of it. Um, what that means is that for our mu's, we just uh, have to plug in um, these things, these values, uh, and, uh, and then just run the code and, and do the calculation. So um, it turned out pretty good. Um, so let me just, uh, yeah, I'll sort of finish by just being careful in this plot. So what are we plotting? Um, also, all this is kind of preliminary um, stuff, but uh, it's looking pretty good so far. Um, OK, I'm plotting the different. So when they run the simulations, uh, this was done with the COLA, uh, the, with, with COLA. Um, so OK, when they run the simulations, you can do both uh, Lambda CDM and, and dark matter. If you take the ratio, or Lambda CDM and uh, DGP, if you take the ratio, you cancel a lot of the cosmic variance, which is uh, really nice, which is why you see that these error bars, OK, so the green is the error bar uh, from the simulation. They're super small because uh, you cancel a lot of the cosmic variance. Now, measuring the ratio of these two power spectra is not really relevant for observation because we don't get to observe two universes. but. Uh, this is just uh, a way to test that really we're computing everything uh, consistently. Um, so anyway, so the green region um, is the errors in the data. The black are the data points. Um, the, the red curve here in the middle is our, um, is our nonlinear calculation with these values of the speed of sound. Really what enters in this plot is just the difference. Uh, but I just want because you can also fit the speed of sound separately to the just lambda CDM data and then the DGP data. And we find that there's a small change, which is kind of expected because this is capturing the UV part of uh, what's going on in the simulation. And um, yeah, when you change the physics, the UV part of the, of the simulation changes, and that's expressed by having a different speed of sound. Um, OK, so this, this uh, is just fit uh, to, to get the best fit. The orange curve is, is uh, with both the speed of sounds set to 0. Um, so kind of standard perturbation uh, approach. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention here is that uh, in order to do this, we also had to do what's called the IR resummation. We've also heard about this. but um, I have two extra curves on here. One is this dotted red one. And this is when, uh, OK, so the, the thick red one is done with the resummation on both power spectra. The dotted red one is done with no resummations. And you can see that the oscillations start coming out of the error bars uh, much earlier than, um, than the resummation. And in fact, if you just kind of to illustrate, if you resum one and not the other, so or just say you screwed up a resummation in some, for some way, or for some reason, you get this blue one. So this is, I think, I just resum the DGP but not the lambda CDM. And so I'm just showing here that this resummation is actually fairly important because uh, if you do it incorrectly, you, you can fail a lot earlier than uh, than you do if if you if you do the full resummation. Um, so yeah, this is in preparation. It should hopefully be um, be available soon. But uh, I think um, I might just stop. Like we did clustering quintessence as well. But uh, actually, I think I'll just stop there. So thanks.
So I, I got confused. So these mu's that so you remember you're showing this um, this set of uh, vertex functions or something like that with the mu's. What what was the uh, what was the relationship with those to the uh, oh those like come the, the second order the actual relationship? So uh, do they come from the second order action or the third order third order action? Ah uh, yeah. So the um, so mu one comes from the first order. So this is yes. all the linear ones, alpha b. Okay, so, so, this, so this comes from this third order. So these three with the integrals, they come from the third order EFT for dark energy. Yeah, exactly. So okay, I understand. No, very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're a mix, obviously. So the mu3 or mu2, these are a mix of the only cubic interactions, but also the interactions which have linear ones also have higher order ones, and so they enter here as well. So that, that's a mix of, yeah, of the first order alpha b and stuff, and then, and then the, the, the brand new ones. Yeah. So um, there, you're correcting basically the kernels to perturbation theory, right? Yeah, yeah, you could look at it that way. Although one of the, yeah, there's no cubic kernel in in, in perturbation theory, but yeah, but you yeah you can think about it that way. So then, um, how how important are these corrections for your power spectrum measurement? Like if you switch off uh, this uh, mu phi two, then does everything yeah, change? Yeah, I mean, or? yeah. So they're uh, they're not. Compl I mean, they're not. Yeah. So. When these mu's are about order one, then these are giving a contribution which is about the same size as the dark matter ones themselves. And uh, the, the k dependence is different. And so um, could have an, uh, an order one change in the one loop power spectrum. So yeah, it's definitely below the, the linear power spectrum, but an order one change in the one loop piece. More questions? If not, thank you. And uh, we'll come back in 20, 25 minutes.